on the question of are our policymakers smart enough? And for that panel, <laughs> I would like to introduce Matthias Ferenius, CEO of Nobel Media, who is our moderator, Lisa Lindström, who's CEO of Doberman, and Mikael Damber, who is Sweden's Minister for Enterprise. Welcome all. Perfect. Mikael Damberg, Minister of Enterprise and Innovation, welcome back to Great the Bell Week Dialogue. Back again. Last year, we invited you as, I think I said, the ideal guest to talk about policymaking when it came to an aging society. Since then, you have handled a government crisis, you have restored Sweden's reputation in Arabic countries, you have put Sweden into a neo industrialization era, you have started innovation advisory boards, and if I read the papers correct, I think Sweden is doing pretty well from an economic perspective. You must be pretty smart. <laughs> I think my teenage daughters might uh, disagree, they don't think I get it all the time. Uh, uh, but more seriously, I think uh, in these times when we see big challenges, I think uh, you must see that no woman or man can have the brains themselves. You have to cooperate. I think the most uh, important thing for a politician is to be smart enough to listen, uh, to actually understand what's happening and to cooperate with researchers or, or business women or, or, or students. Lisa Lindström, I don't have to ask you if you're smart. I know that already. Uh, you are a very successful CEO of Doberman, uh, a uh, service design uh, company. Uh, you are an entrepreneur uh, who have proven yourself uh, many, many times. But lately, you have become very involved in sort of policy making close areas. Uh, you are now uh, the industry or chancellor of industry. Uh, you are uh, very active in, in the public debate. Why? Why have you, with your background, decided to activate yourself that much? It's not really a choice. Uh, I think that for me it's not uh, beneficial to be in, in different segments of our society. I think that since we are all humans we need to contribute with what we have. Uh, and when I was asked and you know, being allowed uh, to collaborate, uh, it's something I have to do. With, with your background, which I think is sort of non-political, what have you learned that you think or, or you almost uh, uh, or you think that can or should be useful uh, when it comes to policy making? First of all, since I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a doer. And I think that uh, many times I see in policy making a lot of talking and where I can contribute and I felt that I can contribute is kind of in the doing, making, suggesting action. And in my other capacity, which is more of design, uh, it's a non-linear, creative way of solving problems. And I think that sometimes may be helpful to maybe bring that to the table. Thanks. Uh, we were in Singapore a few weeks ago and met with the Minister of Education and Skills. And me and the Swedish ambassador tried to invite him to Sweden, because we thought that it would be good for him to come to Sweden and, and be inspired. And he answered very politely and said, I'm sure that Sweden is a nice country, but what should I, why should I go there? What can you learn us? We were a little bit surprised by that answer. Mikael, what do you think that we should have answered? First of all, I think uh, it's quite telling, uh, the question it's in, in itself, because I, Sweden is hugely successful on, on a global scale when it comes to innovation or uh, business, but I would never dream of saying that I would not listen to what other good co countries are doing to actually learn from them. So I, I think it's a mistake, so not being really active on a global scale to actually see what other countries are doing well. I think that's a perspective that we should always have in Sweden. We're good, but we can learn from others and we see that other countries are running quite fast but if you look at the advantages of Sweden I would say that we we're a highly innovative country uh, we're top ranked. In what way? How would you measure that? Yeah we're top three in the world uh, top one in, in European Union when you measure innovation but I'm always saying here at home in Sweden at least that measurement is not totally 
the best way to look at it because uh, it's a lot of input values, it's not the output values. And that's why we need entrepreneurs like Lisa to actually see how do we transform all the knowledge uh, in the Swedish society into new, thing, new ways of thinking, produce or, or uh, change your organization. That, that's still we have a, a way to go. But well, Sweden is a front runner. Uh, we have a strong research tradition uh, and quality. We have um, also a very large number of big global companies. And then we have the vibrant startup scene in Sweden in the digital field. So of course it's interesting to actually see that Sweden now is competing with Silicon Valley in producing unicorns, uh, million dollar worth, uh, billion dollar worth companies um, uh, globally. So of course it's interesting but I'm quite humble because I think always Sweden can learn from other countries that are doing very well on the global scene and Singapore is of course one one country to look at Lisa what would you like uh, Sweden to be able or us to be able to answer in five years time when they've listened to all the advices that you have come up with uh, I would love Singapore and other countries to say hmm I really admire the way that Sweden is taking care of all the engagement in the society and work through all different segments, policy or and academia and large and small companies to solve some really critical megatrends like uh, climate change or our demographical situation, maybe currently our re refugee uh, crisis uh, and to say, Hmm, interesting that they did not only give that to the politicians, that they actually worked with their innovative way to solve this together. We must go there and learn. May I ask, um, add just one thing? Uh, I think that's totally correct what Lisa is saying, but it's also when you look to the future, what actually attracts innovation? I think society will be an even more important thing. Uh, quality of life. Uh, uh, we, we see now that Spotify is recruiting globally on parental leave to actually get young people want to work at Spotify because they get time also with their children and you can recruit both men and women to your companies. And I think these kind of societal uh, questions will be more important in the global competition because innovation always comes down to people and talent and passion and that's why I think societies also play a part and where, where, do you, where do I want to live? Where do I want to go to actually fulfill my dreams? So if we can both uh, take on the societal challenges together but also create a society where people want to be and live, I think that's a great asset for Sweden. And what is your, your role as a, as a policy maker uh, in that? How can you create the society to become better and more, more effective? I think we can do a lot uh, of society, but together with private companies or academia to try to always try to, f win, to find this kind of win-win situation where we cooperate. But society as a whole, I think we have now challenges when it comes to, to the educational system in Sweden, actually. I, I always say that no matter what kind of um, what kind of meeting I go to in Sweden or what kind of company I meet, I say in the long run we have to be able to compete when it comes to education. So I think for Sweden's perspective, I think the uh, investments we're now planning to do in teachers uh, are the most important thing to actually give the educational sh system in Sweden a lift because we have to agree that teachers are perhaps the most important uh, occupation you can find because they're giving our children the start in, in, in life on a good way. So I think this is the main challenge for Sweden now to actually turn the school system around and create a really good and equal uh, um, school system that gives, allows everyone to fulfill their own potential. I think that's the most important thing for Sweden uh, for the future. You have this... <laughs> you have the school sector or you can call it the academic world, you have the policy making world and you have the private sector. How do you think that those three can or should work even closer together. Lisa, from your perspective. First of all, I think that we should see more of action again. Um, what type of action? So that in, instead of uh, having maybe the business world asking for uh, and making a wish list to the politicians, rather say here's where we can contribute and, and start to build things together. Um, 
But secondly, I think it's also important that we think of what are the different roles. So for example, even if we see all these companies, and I also rep represent that, uh, where we could help, there is no uh, promise that, that businesses will be here forever, whereas we will have government forever. So we need to also divide, you know, what is it that you're responsible for and what is it that I'm responsible for? And one of the questions that we saw here is privacy and, and making sure that, you know, that there, uh, our conditions to make sure that we can also live in a safe society and that's kind of more of maybe your role uh, so so be both collaborate but also be clear on the responsibilities right uh, when we talk about this this area the future of intelligence it's easy to be very positive uh, to look at all the possibilities uh, that, that opens up and, and we saw this morning that this is a very optimistic crowd was it 86.1% that, that saw this as a, a, a mainly positive uh, development. But of course, there is a negative side as well. Uh, I saw a new McKinsey report saying that 45% of all activities uh, that are involved in labor will be affected by this, this uh, future. Uh, and of course, there will be people made redundant and there will be a lot of changes. From, from your perspective, how do you look upon it, Lisa? Is it primarily a positive development or do you see threats as well? It's a challenging development. In what uh, way? In the way that uh, we need to have faster changes in our workforce, uh, meaning that you cannot have the same job for your whole life, uh, meaning that companies need to be super flexible uh, in thinking of what their capacity, their talent should do over time. So even if people will change their jobs, 45% of them, uh, it's not, for me, it's not that they will not have a job, they will have a different job. And we need to have a culture and we need to have a mindset in people's minds that I need to contribute in that change. And we need to have business leaders who are super flexible to change when it comes to that. And that's challenging. Mikael, how do you think from your perspective? Afraid I mean, of losing jobs? Uh, I see that many people in the Swedish society and uh, also in other countries are afraid of new technologies. Um, they see the, the challenges that lie ahead and feel only that they see the risk of losing jobs. Uh, I see, yes, there is structural change. I think um, since we took office in this government, I think 400,000 jobs has disappeared in Sweden. 400,000 jobs. But on and the how same time, 480,000 jobs has been created during this time. So there is a massive structural change all the time on the labor market. I usually say when I go, go abroad to other countries uh, that Sweden has the black belt in structural change. And that's something good because we have decided in Sweden that we won't defend old jobs, but we defend people in change. So if they lose their job, they should feel that they have new rights to skills or education to go uh, further, or they have a, a solid insurance system that they don't have to leave their kids or uh, the, the, their house because they get unemployed, because they feel security in change. I think that's a very relevant uh, aspect of this uh, situation now, where change is happening faster, people must follow, and then they have to not be afraid of change, but as feel that there is a security in change. So I, I think Sweden has a good model here as well. Are you prepared? to handle that change? Do you sort of understand? No, we have to do more, we have to do more because basically we've always talked about basic skills. Now we talk about different skills. Also on people that have a university degree might be, be forced to take a diff, different course, uh, an extra course to actually fit in on the labor market to, to transform. So I think the concept of lifelong learning is being really challenged by this rapid transformation. I think Sweden has a lot more to do here to actually keep up the pace. And I think other countries are doing more now, so we cannot rely that Sweden uh, has a top position. I think we have to do more. And I think we need with your teachers um, to think of less than that people are experts and more of uh, in a collaborative way, how can you teach people how to learn? And, and, and not only uh, kids, but also within companies. Lifelong learning. Yeah. Mikael Damberg, Lisa Lindström, thank you so much for coming to Nobelwork Dialogue. And I'm sure I will see you next year as well, no matter what topic. Thank you. <laughs>